Our next speaker is uh, also a member of the National Academy. Did not have to travel very far, just had to walk across campus. Our very beloved uh, colleague, Mark Cullen. Uh, he's the uh, Senior Associate Dean for Research at Stanford. He also directs the Population Health Division. He um, was working with big data and population health before anyone knew what that meant. Did that work at Alcoa when he was uh, with, with Alcoa Company while he was a professor at Yale University. It's my great pleasure to welcome to the podium Mark Cullen. Uh, well, it's, um, it's, a, it's a hard act to follow. I just want to thank the, uh, the sponsors, uh, Suno, Abe, Abe, and others for uh, putting together what's a quite a fabulous, uh, fabulous collection at the end of August. I didn't think you could possibly uh, do it. Um, the, um, I want to first lay out, just so, um, so everyone is clear, what, um, let me see, where, where do I have my slides here? Does this, uh, does this advance my thoughts? Great. Um, everyone is clear where I'm coming from. So I share with Jonathan incredible optimism about the ultimate potential for, um, for the ecosystems of big data that are beginning to evolve um, to transform both public health and health care um, over time. Indeed, I would probably go a step further. I think that the, the ecosystems, not just of health-related information, the biology that we can now uh, look at, but also the ability to link that to life information, which we can, uh, putting aside the, the scary ethical issues, in which we can actually look at virtually every aspect of the life we lead and look at how it impacts health. Together, those augur not just phenomenal opportunities for translation at the bedside and making better decisions and organizing our systems better, but actually for discovery. Most people think about discovery as something that happens in a lab and with experiments and with little animals. In fact, the richness of the observational data and the new techniques of machine learning and artificial intelligence, which are just a, a rapidly evolving uh, and spectacular uh, opportunity for us all, um, create the opportunity for the first time, the, the richness of the data and methods that are evolving with it, actually to do discovery in silico. That's how optimistic I am, that we're going to really answer these questions. And that's what I've devoted in our Center for Population Health here to do. That's kind of where my big optimism for the morning ends. I'm a little less sanguine about the impact of these new technologies to reduce disparities, at least in the long run. So what I want to do in the next few minutes, and I'll try and uh, make up some of our time, is quickly review in a quite explicit way what the, what the hurdle is. I mean, why it is that one might say that intelligence rather than artificial intelligence might be more useful in addressing disparities in the short run. And then I'm going to do something a little that, that, that may be a little anxiety provoking for some of my colleagues here, um, which is to review uh, uh, large set, not such a large set, a, a modest set of the ongoing active projects um, of which I'm aware there are many going on within the institution, but I'm going to talk about some, not to, not to be disparaging or in any way critical of the projects, but to actually talk about them in very real terms about what their impact may be on disparities so we can actually talk as we do our work about what up and downsides there are rather than the very broad generalities which I think Victor brilliantly outlined and, and uh, people should take notes or get this, keep the slides. So anyway, so, um, so let me uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully the slides will cooperate. So this is a, a, um, a map of the United States. I'm going to very quickly review a study that I did with Victor Fuchs a couple of years back. Um, not because the study itself is, is remarkably surprising, but actually just to put in perspective the target that we're trying to hit. So this is essentially the 3,000 counties of the United States divided up. This is for white men, but I could do the same for, have done the same for, for black men and for white and black women. This is divided up by the likelihood at birth based on this one was done in 2000. We repeated it in, with the 2010 data. It's the same. Nothing's changing, unfortunately. Um, the likelihood that a person born in that county on the year 2000 would live to the age of 70. It's a, an easier statistic than life expectancy. Just would you make it past the, the 70 hurdle? Some of you in the room have been lucky enough to do it. A few of us are hoping to do it soon. Um, you can see this big disparities out there. Um, if you're lucky enough to be born in Santa Clara County uh, up there, I don't think I have a light. Do I have a light here? 
Um, if you're lucky enough to be born in Santa Clara County as a white man, your chance was frankly better, greater than 80% today to, um, to make it to uh, cash that Social Security check um, at 70. Not so lucky if you're born in many of those very light counties scattered. Your eyeball thinks they're in the South. They are most of them in the South, but they're pretty widely um, distributed. And we, this is a, what, the, uh, what it looks like, kernel plot of all 3,000 counties. And you can see um, best, if you want to make it to 70, to be a white female, wherever you're born, white females do much better than anyone. In fact, females do much better than their male counterparts, subject for another day. But I think you can see that there are counties, there are many counties in the United States where black men born today have less than a 50% chance of collecting Social Security. I mean, just using 70 as a cutoff. I mean, it's just outrageous how incredible these disparities really are when looked at in this ecologic way. So we just set about to, in old-fashioned, linear regression way, no machine learning, nothing fancy. We have good data on virtually, on a lot of characteristics of these counties. And these next two slides, just a list of the, of the information, much of it from census, much of it from other, other uh, like the EPA website and, uh, and other uh, sources of information, ecologic level information is not individual level information. You'll notice there's no behavioral information here, and that's not because we weren't interested in it, but because we didn't have high quality data for the um, African Americans from enough of the enough of the counties to include it. But but what's shocking is that those 18 variables predict the mortality, the the excess, the premature mortality for every single county. There's no big outliers here. I mean, you can see there's more variation for blacks and for whites for a wide variety of reasons. There's more data for whites. Um, but the, how tightly these counties hug the line is what I want, to, want you to pay attention to. There's not a lot else going on here. And in fact, it's pretty shocking that this is, we can predict 90% of the excess mortality without smoking or obesity data. Now, that doesn't mean at the individual level those things aren't critical. But they're, they're probably driven by the social circumstances, low educational level, low income, um, and other related social factors of these counties. We have a very big hurdle to get over if we're going to deal with disparities. And I think you can see without, without too much uh, artificial intelligence that probably a straightforward approach of dealing with some of those issues, first figuring out which ones are causal, and that I'm very thankful to, to David and his colleagues for, for taking that on, because we do need to know what the drivers are, both at the ecologic level and at the individual level, to effectively address it, uh, especially at the low end. This is a little experiment before I leave it, that a little thought experiment. We used Blinder Oaxaca decomposition to ask the simple question, if blacks were just as well off in each county as whites, what would happen to the black-white disparity? And the black-white disparity, the actual and predicted from the, from the real data, are in blue and, uh, and red. Uh, you can see they're pretty close. The predictions are pretty good. Um, if you transform the black male experience to the white male experience but leave the coefficients the same, it's all gone. <laughs> and pretty much the same is true for women. Um, again, this is, I'm not, we can't do this experiment, wish we could. Um, it's a huge social movement. It just points out that somewhere buried in those 18 factors, um, and we think we know which ones are more important, I won't bore you with that. There, there's plenty for intelligent policymakers to do without much artificial aspect. It doesn't get down to the individual level, mind you. Um, so, so we also know and, and I'm not going to repeat this. I, th I think uh, the previous speaker, Victor, did a wonderful job in Allen. And we also know there's huge um, disparities related to care use. So even within the counties, uh, who's, getting, who's getting the benefit of care and so forth is highly uh, differential. Many of these things probably are amenable to strategies that are being discussed, but the hurdle is pretty, um, pretty steep. So before I talk about the... Um, about the actual experience at Stanford and what we're currently, projects that are currently ongoing and, and use them as sort of grist to talk about the issues di directly. Just want to point out this, um, this quite fascinating paper. So, so Daniel Weiss is a graduate student in Norway, but he's a, he's a student of, uh, of Jeremy Fries in the sociology department here. And Jeremy has been a leader, as now Daniel is sort of taking up the mantle, at actually looking systematically from a perspective of a sociologist as the impact of new technologies in general, 
and how they affect disparities. And this is one of six pages of tables. I think they reviewed about 50 technologic interventions, including such ones as the CT and MRI scanners, electronic health records, to just name a few. And I'm, without getting into the, the detail of, of the results of these studies, it's not pretty. The, the experience of the introduction of new technologies, for reasons, again, that I think the previous speaker outlined quite well, leads us to worry quite a lot that introducing something big and fancy, however fabulous it may be in the long run for healthcare on average, the initial effect is to benefit part of our society to a far greater extent than another, widening disparities despite efforts often conceived of in advance to, uh, to address that. Um, there are a bunch of issues to anticipate, and I don't want to spend a lot of time um, uh, trying, to, uh, trying to, to raise them, but let's just quickly note that we're clearly worried about the cost of things. We already know, for example, from the introduction of many of the new uh, individually directed uh, therapies in cancer that insurance companies have been quite loath to pay it, and you know, so the, the, the richest of our society are getting access to these great new treatments. Most of our society is not yet. Um, there's obviously some cultural difference in people's willingness to, to accept, uh, to accept um, some of those treatments. Um, I'm going to show you this in, in, in an actual example or two in a minute. But one of the problems with, with artificial intelligence, and I think, I think Emma spoke to it a little bit in, in, her, in her talk earlier, uh, one of the problems is that it takes social, it, 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 if it's enlightened enough to take social information into account in predicting whatever <clears throat> it is about to predict, the possibility is of taking whatever biases may exist in our society already or in the data that are presented and hard, bakes them hard into the algorithm with potentially unintended consequences. She showed an educational example. I'm going to talk a little bit about two potential, among, among projects ongoing here, two potential examples of that um, that, um, that may exist. And then, of course, there's the problem of, you know, the data most likely come from, from the subset of the population that is most, uh, has most access to care and to the benefits of society. And they're far more likely to, uh, to participate in its use. So, so we have reasons to worry up front. So now I'm going to spend a few minutes. Um, and again, I just want to caution you that nothing of what I'm about to say is intended to be critical of what I think are brilliant projects. And many of my colleagues who are doing the projects are sitting here. So uh, this, is, this is not intended to be criticism, but only a way of looking very practically at things we are doing here and how they might play out. So the first one I just want to mention is the Apple Watch study, Apple Heart study. It's an incredible study ongoing in which literally over a few months, the, our investigators here, Ken Mahaffey and, and, uh, and Mintu uh, and their colleagues have enrolled 440,000 people to see whether or not asymptomatic older adults can have potentially dangerous and uh, actionable arrhythmias detected asymptomatically. Now, there's only one small hitch, which is to do it, you need to wear an Apple Watch. You need to own an Apple Watch. And I don't think you need much, um, much guidance here to understand if indeed it turns out, we don't know the result yet, if indeed it turns out that this is a fabulous way to detect uh, early arrhythmias. Someday there may be something that everyone can have, but for the time being, it's unlikely to have huge impact in the poorer part of our population. Likely the work that uh, likewise, the work that, that are some of the work that's going on in Sam Gambier's lab, incredible diagnostic work, developing new physical toys that can passively monitor our environment, pick up early, early signs of risk, pick up early signs of infection, uh, and so forth. Once again, these are, these are toys, big toys, fabulous toys, but they're much more likely, at least initially, um, to end up in the homes of people like us than they are in the homes of people who are probably the, the more deprived of uh, those with a, um, a higher likelihood of dying before 70. Let's put it that way. Now, here's one that, that, that's really disturbing. So, so Lee Williams in the psychiatry department here, absolutely brilliant idea, and based on a lot of her own work, that in fact the, the current process most of us go through when, when, when things like anxiety and depression hit, the process we go through of sort of empirically figuring out cheaply, but empirically figuring out which of the many drugs might actually work. It takes the typical patient six, eight, 10, 12 months before he or she finds a, something that is effective. Just I'm thinking about drug therapy. So the purpose of her center um, is to invest heavily upfront 
using a lot of biologic testing, omics type testing, genetic and otherwise, as well as a lot of imaging, PET scan, and, and some other more novel things that her team has developed in order to come up with, it, with an actionable diagnosis. The, the theory being that the return on investment would suggest that if you don't waste eight or 10 months disabled, missing work, being unproductive, being miserable, it's worth the upfront 10 or 20 or $30,000 of diagnostic costs. And for many of us sitting in the room, I think even if we didn't have insurance, we might be willing to, uh, to make that trade-off because it's probably a good trade-off. But you can well imagine that if, the, if you neither have the resources, nor the insurance, nor is your daily life valued at such a high level um, because you don't make that much in the workplace, it's no longer a good choice. And these, once again, these are great technologies, but they're far more likely, and foreseeably, to be valuable to the likes of us than to the, peop the two people that are less served. Now here are two that, are, that, are, that, that I view as being more complex to think about. The green button, um, Nigam Shah, who I think I saw in the audience, absolutely brilliant idea of taking valuable information we can learn from the EMR and linked records in a large healthcare system and making that information available in, in a very clinically relevant form to clinicians who have decisions to make that for which there is no good uh, you know, class A randomized controlled trial level data, which means every decision we make, more or less, because, I mean, unfortunately, that's where, a lot, especially in the in-hospital situation. So this is a very prominent part of our, of our work. And the good news is that this kind of work can bring in social factors to whatever extent one chooses to do it, but at the potential risk of conflating the importance of the social factor with the observations, so that decisions may be made, which in some sense, take advantage of the fact that, for example, the, the blacks in a, in a particular population may fare more poorly than the Caucasians in the same group. Not for reasons that are easily measurable or easily controllable, but may lead to dangerously flawed decision making, and they're very hard to judge. Likewise, a, process that, uh, a project that John Leverett is leading out at the VA, looking at providing clinicians information on can, on prostate cancer, unrelated cause, risk of death, so that decisions about how aggressive to be can be tempered against the patient's actual life expectancy. So you don't put an 83-year-old to through dreadful, extensive chemotherapy, radiotherapy, when it looks like they have less than a year to live, based on the end. And once again, it's fantastic. But you run the risk of hard baking into that algorithm things that, for example, lead you to under-treating African Americans with prostate cancer because you think they're, oh, the algorithm predicts they're more likely to die. They are more likely to die, unfortunately. So it's a little bit like the old dilemma for those of you who've been around as long as I have that we had a few years back in thinking about whether at the bedside should we be presenting patients as a 73-year-old African American man or should we, should we basically be you know, sort of agnostic to that at the risk of profiling and biasing the audience into assuming some social or other characteristic? And we debated this. There's no, there's no right answer. On the one hand, the profiling information is fabulously, um, from a Bayesian point of view, predictive. It does help you under, sort of go in the right direction. On the other hand, it's a, it's a bias that having recognized it, it's pretty hard to, to get around. Anyway, I'm gonna conclude by talking about four projects, and I, I won't spend a lot of time because I, I wanna leave you all a few minutes of a break, um, with four projects that I think are a little clearer in terms of their impact on, on, um, on disparities, because they were designed to address disparities. And, and I guess part of my point here is, is that for those of you who really are you know, socially conscious about this, it's actually worth thinking about the design of, of a project. So the first one is the work of Sanjay Basu, and it's a series of algorithms, all quite amazing, in which he combines large data sets for the purpose of being able to judge in simulations what might happen with various forms of social interventions. Now, it doesn't take into account the, the, what I hope someday will come out of David, uh, the, you know, the Grusky Group, some national poverty study, but at least it gives you some insight as to whether you know, an earned income tax is actually likely to benefit the people you expect it to benefit from a health point of view. And we have enough data now to do those kinds of things. Our Voice, a project of Abby, Abby King and her colleagues in which a handheld device in the hands of people, and these are now in 50 countries in the world in multiple, multiple languages, in which people in poor neighborhoods can input observations that they make 
during the day about the neighborhood, places that are dangerous, places that are polluted, um, difficulty in getting access to, good, to you know, vegetables and, and groceries and so forth. And the information can be integrated over the neighborhood so that a neighborhood can quickly participate in teaching itself about its own targets for intervention. It's quite amazing. And she's gone quite far with it. Preterm Connect, I'm gonna, actually I'm gonna show you these last two uh, in a slightly greater detail. Um, so this is uh, work that Jason Wang and colleagues are doing with um, support of the uh, RK Mellon Foundation in Pittsburgh in which they are using handheld devices in particular to attack the enormous disparity that exists. This is Allegheny County for those of you who know it. Um, the, uh, the, an enormous effort to look at where preterm birth uh, you know, premature birth is excessive. This, is a, this has been an intractable problem because we really don't know very much about its causes yet. And this is the hope that by, by zeroing in on high-risk communities that we can actually learn something about this, which, which has just terrible ramifications, unfortunately. And, uh, and that's the purpose of it. Um, and I just won't go further with that. Um, this, is a, this is another one. Oops, it's one of these fancy slides. I'll try and go through the noise here. I didn't make these slides, but I just want to show you the idea here. Oops, let me go back to that one. So the idea here is, is very simply that we now have some counties in the state of California which have full health information exchanges and the will on the part of the commissioners of our counties to use the data now from every health system on every single member of the, every single individual in the county to actually address serious and, um, and actionable items at the county level in which social information collected by various agencies can be combined with what we now have from the Health Information Exchange to really target places that, for which there may be a, uh, an, a previously unanticipated solution. And the exciting thing is that, that the, um, the counties listed now formed an organization, um, have developed a strategy for working very directly with us as, as sort of their research arm. Uh, to help identify these, what, you know, where neighborhoods um, have the possibility of this action. And hopefully five years from now, I can actually show you the kinds of things we can do um, with that. In any event, I'm going to stop here. Um, there's more cool stuff to, sh to show, but, but I want you guys to have your break, and I'll just I'll stop, with, uh, I'll stop with that. Anyway, thank you all. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.